So what are these debates about? Not, not the ones in this studio, no argument there. No, the debates between candidates for elected office. Are they about substance or style, policy or punchlines? Our panels brought its scorecard from Tuesday's one and probably only uh, showdown between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. We'll ask if it all went to script and what that script is. In a tight race with huge consequences for the entire planet, a fleeting instance of infotainment or a moment that might move the needle, central is the strategy in 2024. Is it all about energizing your followers or convincing the undecided and the apathetic? What does this race say about the United States and the path it wants to pursue? Today in the France 24 debate, we're asking if Tuesday's debate in Philadelphia moved the needle. And joining us from New York, she campaigned for Barack Obama and Bernie Sanders, writer and activist Nomiki Konst. Good to see you. Nice to see you too, and thank you for having me. Uh, we're joined from Washington by a Republican strategist, uh, Dan Hazelwood, president of uh, Target of Creative Communications. Thanks for being with us. A Frenchman in New York, he is usually, but he's graced us with his presence in this studio. Tristan Cabello, lecturer in American Civilization at Johns Hopkins University. Good to be here. Which is in Baltimore, not That's New right, York. that's right. <laughs> okay. Uh, with us as well, our former White House correspondent, France 24 International Affairs Editor, Kedivan Gorgestani, who that's went right. for the extra money and stayed up very late to watch the whole thing live. <laughs> Woke up very early. <laughs> Woke up very early, there you go. Uh, your reactions on the hashtag F24 debate. Yeah, after fight night in Philadelphia, uh, a moment of civility for the cameras. On the morning after, Donald Trump and Kamala Harris both attending 9-11 commemorations at the Ground Zero Memorial in Lower Manhattan. Kedavon, talk us through that handshake, if you will, that we just uh, saw a replay of. Well, uh, at least this time they were uh, both willing to uh, do that handshake because during the debate, uh, Kamala Harris uh, forced the handshake a little bit because Donald Trump was trying to get away a little bit. But this time, uh, this was a more formal and normal handshake, if you will, I think. Uh, it was um, a brief moment in time. Very. <laughs> uh, t tell us a little bit about what, you th what your first takeaway is from the debate. Um, my first and main takeaway was that uh, the Harris team had said our strategy is she needs to bait him and to get him off message. And if you bar the first 10, 15 minutes when he was focused and he was talking about the economy and attacking her and staying pretty much on a uh, message, the rest of the time, every time she baited him, he took the bait. Uh, you saw that when she uh, commented about the size of his crowds, and we know that Donald Trump doesn't like anybody uh, contesting the size of his crowds. He went directly for uh, the bait, and I think uh, the Democrats were extremely happy that that part of the strategy uh, worked because it prevented Donald Trump from attacking Kamala Harris on some of the perceived weaknesses uh, like immigration, like crime, it worked a little bit more on the economy. Tristan Cabello? Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, she was calm, she was collected, she was um, uh, she was presidential. She managed really to uh, present herself. Uh, a lot of Americans still don't know who she is, uh, but she also managed to present her vision for America, her perspective on her platforms. And uh, you're totally right, she pushed really all of Donald Trump's trigger points, uh, crowd sizes, um, January 6th, uh, abortion, um, COVID. Uh, and it's true that Donald Trump faded away throughout uh, the debate. He uh, declined, you think? He uh, really did decline. And that was very uh, perceptible uh, with the split screen. I mean, she was uh, really open on one side, happy, smiling, and he was sinking literally uh, with uh, his face showing um, uh, that he was either angry or sad. Uh, but there was really here a duality and an opposition that was uh, very stark on the screen. All right, we're, we're having a, 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 a audio issues with Washington, so we'll try to reconnect with Dan Hazelwood as, as quickly uh, as, as we can. Uh, Kedavon, uh, talking about the format a little bit there, um, uh, and you had something we didn't see maybe four or eight years ago so much, which is 
uh, Donald Trump called out by the moderators, like, for instance, when he claimed uh, that immigrants were kidnapping and eating house pets in Ohio. He was called out, but only some of the time. Um, here's one that the, didn't get fact-checked. Let's listen. They have abortion in the ninth month. They even have, and you can look at the governor of West Virginia, the previous governor of West Virginia, not the current governor, who's doing an excellent job, but the governor before, he said, the baby will be born and we will decide what to do with the baby. In other words, we'll execute the baby. He did get... He actually did get a fact check because uh, the moderator, and I'm sorry, I can't remember her name, immediately said that's called murder and it's not legal in anywhere in the United States. So he did get fact check. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it's the question of, uh, and this is how it's been spun, uh, we can perhaps show uh, the, the front page uh, of today's uh, uh, New York Post. Uh, that is that uh, there is this feeling that that there's a cabal between Harris and ABC News, uh, which, uh, which uh, hosted uh, the, the debate. Uh, uh, Nomiki Konst, uh, uh, people in the newsroom here were a little surprised by, by this, seeing the, uh, the moderators uh, weighing in on, uh, on, on the, f the facts that uh, were served up by Donald Trump. You know, there's been tremendous pressure from media figures uh, all over the world, really, calling out people like Dana Bash on CNN, who hadn't pushed back enough, and calling out uh, the New York Times. I mean, people who were writers for the New York Times have been calling, back, calling them out. Uh, Margaret Sullivan, who monitors media, has been calling them out for showing two sides, like we used to do over the climate debate. Um, so I'm glad that they fact-checked. They didn't fact-check enough. Uh, he... I, I, I label him now as Dark Web Don because uh, the theories that he was putting out there were really pulled from the darkest places on the Internet. And the people that he cited for his sources on TV are people who really have a problem with truth. Uh, I've been on Fox News many times and not everybody at Fox News has a problem with truth. But he was citing hosts that have driven conspiracy theories across this country that again are pulled from the darkest places on but the internet. No, no, Miki, let me, let me play devil's advocate here because you're from the sure. land of uh, entertainment and uh, Donald Trump's come from uh, reality television and he's big on uh, uh, wrestling, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> not, not, not the actual wrestling you see at the Olympics, but the, the, uh, the, the fake version. That, uh, uh, and so do Americans just see this as a bit of entertainment? I mean, it surely was an entertaining debate, <laughs> but with that being said, it was also very concerning. The look on Kamala Harris's face was, I think, the feeling so many Americans were having that don't watch his rallies all the time, that don't go and, and sit in for hours to go and meet him. I think we know who he is. He was our president. But to see how much he spiraled and declined and how far down the conspiratorial rabbit hole he's gone is it's not reflective. Let me be very clear to everybody in France right now. It is not reflective of this country. You know, he's going to have to build a coalition of supporters that don't just believe in conspiracy theories. He's struggling with that. And those undecided swing state voters, he has to win over some of the women to be able to win. And I just don't think he's going to be able to do that. My, my question is, is that an exercise like this one, a debate, uh, yeah. Is it parsed as kind of a bit of entertainment, a bit like when the British read out very loud tabloid headlines? Uh, they, they know it's not the, 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 the points being exaggerated. Or are people genuinely outraged by when Donald Trump announces that babies are going to be executed after, uh, at birth? I think probably for the political class, it's a little more entertaining. We're paying more attention to the policies and watching the news all day long. Uh, but... I think a lot of people tuned in for the first time and were looking to see who Kamala Harris was and what plans she had. And that was reflected in the focus groups, that people were impressed with her opportunity economic plan, uh, and they were quite scared of Donald Trump's rhetoric, which I wish it was just entertainment. I mean, that would be great, but it's not. We've had a Donald Trump presidency. We've seen what he's been able to do and not do. We know he, when he claims in Project 2025 that he wants to eliminate the Department of Education, that's very possible because he barely staffed the State Department. We know what his relationship is like with Putin now. It's not a surprise anymore. It's not funny. It's actually very scary. And if people are 
side at this point, I really hope that Taylor Swift's uh, endorsement of Kamala Harris uh, trumps any of those undecideds who who may be leaning towards Trump, which is what I think. Um, and, you know, hopefully that'll make up the difference. All right, you mentioned Project 2025. We can now cross to Dan Hazelwood uh, in Washington. Dan, apologies for those audio issues which seem uh, to, to, to now be uh, fixed. Project 2025 is a sort of a policy paper by uh, some Trump supporters. Again, at uh, Tuesday's debate, Trump distanced himself, saying he's got nothing to do with it. How do you, how do you think uh, he fared? Do people, do people now know who Donald Trump is, and so this was just standard fare? Or... Did he, as Tristan Cabello was saying, fade during that uh, uh, encounter with Kamala Harris? So the debate last night, Donald Trump was the same Donald Trump that we've seen for his four years as president, for his campaign this year, all the way back to 2016. Uh, nothing new there. I, I don't think anybody was particularly surprised by what he did or didn't do. It's just was the same old Trump. Just the same old Trump, and uh, is that good or bad? So fundamentally, this debate actually probably didn't change one vote in all of America. I think it was a good debate for America to see both candidates. Harris did a good job for herself. She had a tactical victory. She proved to a lot of Democrats who had a lingering doubt. You know, they just they dumped Joe Biden because of his bad performance. Uh, you know, and they put in her and I think there was a lingering doubt. And I think she put that one away. She did a good job delivering her message it, that, that she was there and ready to go toe to toe with Donald Trump. Where her failing was, I would say, was the fundamental problem of this election for the Democrats and also to a degree for Trump, but it's worse for the Democrats, it's the reason why this race is close, is the center 10% of America that distrusts both political parties, is not enthusiastic about either political candidate. Their number one issue is who's going to be better for them on the economy. And Harris did not really move the ball forward on that. That's probably what she sort of strategically really needed to do. But she had a lot of other tactical successes here. And Donald Trump was the same Donald Trump that we saw you know, for the last eight years. Yeah, when the debate began, the first question went to the vice president. Kamala Harris pointedly was asked, it was a pretty clear question, about the impact of inflation on constituents. Here's how she started her answer. I was raised as a middle-class kid, and I am actually the only person on this stage who has a plan that is about lifting up the middle-class and working people of America. I believe in the ambition, the aspirations, the dreams of the American people. She did not answer that question, Kedavon Gorgistani. Uh, it seemed a little bit wooden. What was the strategy there? Well, look, the, the strategy was that they know that the economy is their weak spot. And Why didn't she just answer a question about inflation? Well, because there is also a problem, and... On that, Donald Trump did land a few of his blows, was that you don't really have a plan, and whatever plan you have is a little bit Joe Biden for four more years. And so, uh, as Dan was saying, she didn't really alleviate some of the doubts on that part. She didn't make her case on the economy. Yes, she's put out a few concrete measures about, for example, making housing more affordable or capping the price of groceries, and that does work a little bit better than Joe Biden's messaging, which was, look at all the macroeconomic numbers. We're telling you that the economy is doing well. Basically, you should be feeling it too, even though people in the United States were not feeling that uh, economic strength. So she's done a little bit better than him in that she's saying, I understand that you're struggling and we are going to try to make changes. But the fact is, she is coming out of four years. It's also her administration. And she hasn't managed yet to show a really comprehensive economic plan that would convince uh, those people that she's going to do what Joe Biden hasn't done for four years. Uh, Namiki, uh, Konst, how would you have answered that question? I actually like that she went personal and talked about her experience growing up and her pains and how she uh, relates to most American people, whereas she also called out Donald Trump for receiving a 40, $400 million gift from his father and being born with a silver spoon in his mouth and being a dirty landlord who uh, was sued for 
for breaking laws, racial discrimination laws in our country when it came to uh, housing. With that being said, I do think she could have uh, upped her game a little bit with the economy. She does have a plan. The Opportunity Economic Plan is a strong plan. There are $6,000 per child in tax credits. Uh, that will make a huge difference in people's lives. Uh, you know, she, I think she could have defended the student loan program more. That changed my life. My student loans were eliminated personally. One day I, I opened up my email and I owed zero. That makes a big impact. We don't have the social security nets that, that Europe has. And so countered with inflation, which is happening globally, even if the macroeconomics are improving, we still have these deep-seated issues like debt and the cost of housing. Mm. Um, I don't think many millennials are talking about purchasing houses. It's a good offer that she has, but we need rent relief too. So, you know, I think she has a lot more room to grow on the economic plan. Um, she's been backed, been backed by labor across the board, uh, with exception to the police. And so she, you know, clearly is on the right track, but needs to hammer it home more. And I'm looking forward to seeing what Tim Walls uh, brings forward because his background when it comes to economic progressivism is very strong. And I can't wait to see him, him go up against uh, J.D. Vance and, and share that side of, of the place. And also their plans mm. coming together. I, I, it's not an excuse, but they really haven't had a lot of time to campaign on this. And so I also would have liked right, her to champion the accomplishments of Joe Biden as well. She didn't She didn't answer that, that, that question initially. Uh, Tristan Cabello, uh, I know that uh, there are still people out there who perhaps aren't news politics junkies and mm -hmm. don't quite know who she is and what, or what her story is. They know she's the vice president, but... The, and so, but is is the your opening sentence of your first answer the place to do it? Yeah, and the problem with Kamala Harris is that we don't really know, uh, even people who live in America, uh, what she stands for. I mean, she's been very ambiguous on many of her policies. She was once a progressive. She became a more centrist politician recently. Uh, and the main problem that she's been having in this campaign is really to uh, put forward a vision. I mean, she's always saying that she's want, she wants to move America forward, uh, but we don't really know in what direction she's really going, and we don't really know what she stands for. And so, of course, she has a couple of uh, politics, policies that she wants to put in place when she's going to be president. And now we just mentioned a few of them, but there's no vision there. And there's very few of those policies to really maintain and mobilize uh, an electorate. Uh, just recently, she just had it recently a tab on her, uh, on her website with her platform and that was only three days ago. Um, so that means that for 60 days, really nobody knew uh, what she was standing for. So the program, the platform is still a bit blurred. She constantly refers to herself as the anti-Donald Trump, the anti-Project 2025. But I would like to know what is the Project 2025 for the Democratic Party, right? D D Dan Hazelwood, uh, our panel talking about 10% undecideds, but in the United States, it's always a bit uh, hazy because there are the undecideds and there are those who perhaps won't go vote for because it's very difficult to vote in the United States. You have your elections on a Tuesday. Uh, uh, so, in effect, uh, is the strategy in a debate to energize those who already support you to make sure they vote or is it to uh, try to, again, convince those who might still be sitting on the fence? And 10% doesn't sound like a lot. Well, there's two pieces, I would say. First of all, it is actually pretty easy to vote in the United States. I happen to be actually in, in France during the French elections. And mechanically, it's basically the same ease in both countries. The, the, the challenge is for Americans is do they feel it's is it worth their time to go vote meaning are they going to get something for it do they do they feel that the politicians are listening to them so when we say 10% undecided that's sort of a a bit grayer than the term undecided what i would say it's the 10% in the middle that are kind of dis uh, unhappy with their choices they know they have to choose one and they don't see anybody talking to him. And so the, 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 the mistake that I think Harris made last night, and she did a lot of things well, due to her credit, uh, but the mistake that she made was, and, and I think the Democratic campaigns in general, 
the number one issue to those voters that are going to decide who's the next president of the United States are economic issues. And they decided to start her off with, I'm going to be empathetic and I'm going to tell your story. And to your question that you just asked, this was not the place to do it. No one is, can really tell their story, their life experience in a, a one and a half minutes of the opening of a debate. She should have gone forward with a policy agenda that speaks to working and middle class Americans who are economically unhappy. They're also, they're also some of them concerned about their safety, but economic concerns are first and foremost. And some of these technical issues that, that she talked about in some of her policies, I don't think the Democrats have figured out how to articulate it. And as we look at the terrain in the next 56 days that this political campaign will be waged on, that middle thinks that Donald Trump did a better job for them on economic issues. Now, people will debate, as you said, macro neck economic issues. But when you ask people what they feel, that is their reality. And that is what Harris and the Democrats are missing at the moment. And why fundamentally this debate last night isn't going to change one vote. Right. Although that's the, the I guess you could say the glass half empty if you're a Harris supporter. The glass half full is that after the debate, she got well, the mother of all endorsements in an Instagram post signed Taylor Swift, childless cat lady, the pop idol throwing her full weight behind the Democratic uh, nominee. Uh, by the way, Trump taking it in stride, telling Fox News that Swift, quote, will pay a price for it in the marketplace. Uh, how much, I guess, who do I begin with? I'll begin with you, Nomiki Kunz. How much is a Taylor Swift endorsement worth? Well, I, I, my colleague here says that not one vote moved. Well, that was one vote, and that was a very powerful vote that can move many others. You know, a few years ago, she uh, asked her supporters to register to vote, and they did. And there was record turnout for certain demographics. It had an influence on the election. We are in a completely different uh, reality when it comes to campaigning now. You know, it, it costs sometimes millions of dollars to reach in certain districts those undecided voters. The last election was decided by 60,000 votes in swing states. So if Taylor Swift can mobilize newly registered voters in particular, those who are just turning um, 18, and ask them and sways them, sway them to vote for Kamala Harris, and my guess is because she's winning with women right now, and especially with young women, and the gender divide is larger than it's ever been in history, this could potentially impact those voters. And it's a lot less expensive than buying millions of dollars in ads, mail, phone calls for undecided voters in swing states who I believe, I don't think it's about they don't like the choices. I think that they're, and the focus group showed this, they're dissatisfied with Donald Trump, but they don't feel comfortable yet with Kamala Harris. And I think that's about something deeper. I don't think it is just about her plans because she explains her plans. She's a politician. She changed her positions just like Donald Trump does all day long. But there's a different type of criticism of Kamala Harris. And I'm really hoping that the Swifties turn out and uh, make it a, a, you know, nail them out if they decide not to vote for Kamala Harris at the end of the day. Well, before I ask the panelists on set, Dan Hazelwood, what moves the needle more, the debate or Taylor Swift? <laughs> Neither of them. And, and I, I say this, I've got three Swifties <laughs> that are teen kids in my household. And like, I appreciate the Taylor Swift phenomenon. It's amazing. She's a tremendous artist. But I've been doing this for three and a half decades. Celebrity endorsements do not move votes. It's an energy. It's fun. It's going to be great to be around the Harris campaign. That's all important. It's something Joe Biden had lost, which was why he was going to lose this election very badly. But, this, but nobody is going to change their vote because of Taylor Swift. She was always with the Harris and the Democratic campaign. That was never in doubt. So it's good and it's a lot of fun and enthusiasm and, and they might have great rallies. But at the end of the day, the people who are going to decide this election have other priorities. Kedavon Gorgistani. She is definitely probably not going to sway any uh, potential Trump-leaning voter to come over to Kamala Harris's side. That said, when you're in a race this close and what you're trying to do is get every single one of your possible voters out to vote, if... Taylor Swift is your idol and you're a Swifty and you were kind of not caring about politics. And she says, 
you need to vote. And I think her post was very interesting in the sense that she didn't say, go vote for Kamala Harris. She said, do your research, choose. I did my research, I chose, I'm voting for Kamala Harris. But she mostly said, go and vote. So I think she won't sway anyone, but she might help some of those young Democrats uh, toward leaning Democrat, because obviously a big chunk of her uh, fans are left leaning and she has uh, not endorsed, but expressed her political opinions in the past. Uh, she might get a little bit, a small percentage of young voters to actually turn out and vote. And in a race this close, if you motivate just 1% of the sort of 18 to 25, that could, I'm not saying it will, but that could tip it because what you want in this election, yes, it's to convince some of those undecided uh, voters, but it's also to maximize your voter turnout. And Kamala Harris actually said it, She's uh, or her team, somebody said, uh, we are not as afraid of losing to or voters to Trump as we are to losing them to the couch. And I think on that note, maybe Taylor Swift's endorsement might help. So Tristan Cabello, you're often called upon, I think, to explain yeah, um, this, this Taylor Swift phenomenon to the French. Well, I mean, as, as a, a professor who teaches uh, uh, exactly you know, that target group, um, I can testify that indeed Taylor Swift is very popular between uh, for people between the age of 18 and 23. Uh, but it could be also a double-edged sword here. Uh, because the Democratic Party keeps being portrayed as the party of the elite, of the establishment, uh, of the cultural elite, of the political elite. I mean, that was the case at the convention, for example. We saw John Legend, we saw the singer Pink, we saw the Obamas, the Clintons. Those are all people who are doing well. And so in opposition, you have Donald Trump, who can also mobilize on this, saying, hey, I'm defending you, the underdogs, the working class. I mean, that sounds crazy given, given Donald Trump is a billionaire, but, but that, that could also work in that way. Uh, Namiki Hans, you, you take the point uh, that um, uh, putting up Kid Rock uh, <laughs> is also uh, a way of uh, establishing Donald Trump's brand? It was very Donald Trump. I, I was at the convention and along with the John Legends and uh, the, the celebrities that were there, the Kerry Washingtons, you also had union leaders, you had women who have been uh, raped and, ha and had to carry uh, babies out in s districts that are being affected by these abortion and reproductive rights laws. You had a whole coalition of people. I never thought in a million years that Bernie Sanders, who I worked for, would be in alliance with Dick Cheney. And as Bernie Sanders said, Dick Cheney and Bernie Sanders have nothing in common for one thing, keeping the democratic institutions in place in this country. And I think that's really what the Democratic Party is representing right now is the pro-America party. It's the, do you feel like this country needs stability party? And Donald Trump is somebody who, as Kamala Harris said, has sold off our, 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 our technology, our military technology to China. I mean, he has obviously been praised by Viktor Orban and Vladimir Putin, mm. and Kim Jong-un wrote a love letter to him. I mean, that sounds like it's a gimmick, but it is not. That is deeply what is on the minds of a lot of these voters, is this country is not unifying around our, our, our nationalism anymore, and he weaponized nationalism against us. So, yes, I think the Democrats have had a major problem with big donors and I think that we're shifting away from that. And I, I, I can say that as somebody who's been on the DNC Reform Commission and been in those debates, uh, we are leaning a lot more towards labor. That was the Tim Walls choice. It was the choice of the guy who has never made over $100,000 in his life, the guy who was a public school teacher and his wife and his family members, his daughter's a social worker. And meanwhile, he's a governor. Um, this was her showing that the Democratic Party is moving in a more progressive working class. Jan direction. Hazelwood, we had uh, Kamala Harris uh, point during the debate to that endorsement by uh, former uh, Republican Vice President uh, Dick Cheney. Will that win her any votes? <laughs> well, it'll get, it'll get Dick Cheney and his daughter and his family's votes, but these votes were never up for grabs. They weren't for Donald Trump four years ago. I mean, you know, the, the, the Cheneys and the Trumps have not been friends for a long time. And 
and I, I respect Cheney's service to this country and the work that he's done. It's an odd coalition to put Dick Cheney on the Democratic side. I, I think everybody will agree with that. But politics are uh, there. The coalitions are shifting. The Democratic Party is now appealing to wealthier, more educated people. You know, I'm a Ronald Reagan Republican. That's what we were attacked for being back in the early 80s. And now the, the Republicans have become the more working class party. And so you see the, the, the pick that was just described of Walls to try and hold on to those voters who are defecting from the Democratic Party, the working class voters. One of the shifts that's out there that's going to be fascinating to watch when we see the election results are working class minority voters seem to be moving towards the Republican side. At what level is we're going to find out here? But there's a lot of fluidity going on here. And the, the old coalitions and the old labels are changing. And, and Trump is a big part of accelerating that. Uh, and, it, and it's new for all of us. All right, a final word on, on, on Tuesday's debate, because uh, there's the reviews of it. And if you read them in the ma in mainstream publications like Time magazine, which promises on its cover an explanation of how Kamala Harris knocked Donald Trump off course with uh, the, uh, uh, the job in trouble, the title there, in trouble. Is there, a, 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 and this gets back to something Tristan Cabello said about elites, is there a whiff of hubris in that magazine cover, uh, Kedavan Gorgistani? Probably a little bit, but also uh, there is a, a tendency, you know, there's a debate, you need to come out with, there's a winner, there's a loser, and, uh, the thing is, nobody is saying that she won the election. We, what the, those um, headlines are saying is she won the debate. And everybody knows, especially the Democrats, that winning debates doesn't guarantee winning the election. And you look at 2016 and Hillary Clinton, who was seen as uh, pretty much winning most of those uh, debates, and yet she went on to lose. So uh, they... The, the headlines, yes, she did a great job. And the thing is, because the bar was actually pretty low, everybody, the, the, the conversation was, she's hiding away from unscripted moments. She can't hold her own in unscripted moments. Uh, that's why she's not going out in front of reporters. And yet she was there for more than an hour and a half and she held her own. So, and he didn't do what he was asked from his campaign. So yes, she won. Mm -hmm. Not to cry victory too soon. That is something that actually I think it was Doug Emhoff right after the debate. When her, her husband. She, her husband when uh, she uh, went in, uh, in front of uh, some supporters and he said, you won the debate. We have not won anything yet. Mm. And I think that sentence sums up mm. where the Democratic Party is. They're very happy with the result of the debate but they know it's not winning them the election. A lot can happen. Exactly eight weeks separate Tuesday's debate from Election Day in the United States, except there's early voting in many states. Uh, in swing state Pennsylvania, uh, which hosted uh, the encounter in Philadelphia, citizens can start casting their ballots next Monday. Uh, so maybe winning a debate matters more, arguably, Tristan Cabello, than it did in 2016, marginally more? I don't know. Not really. I mean, this is, this is, this is going to be an election that's going to be uh, won at the margins, really. It's going to be really down to three or four states, even more precisely, maybe down to a couple of precincts. Uh, in those three or four states, so a couple of thousand votes. I'm sure that, as as uh, Dan said, um, uh, this 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 debate is not going to change anything in terms of vote voting, but it may mobilize people who were already sure to vote for the Democratic Party or for the Republican Party. And this is really the strategy that Donald Trump is envisioning here: it's to mobilize uh, his base, uh, uh, and that's what he did during the debate, really. Uh, it's confusing to explain, Dan Hazelwood, the early voting, because the rules aren't exactly the same from state to state. You mentioned 56 days until uh, November 5th. When do people make up their minds? So we've got a lot of data on this. And actually, the, you know, the, we have billions of dollars on, throughout America of research of how people vote and a lot of history. 
we know that the people who vote early are already decided. They know who they were voting for four months ago. They're just waiting and they're getting it to their opportunity and they get it out of the way and do it. They're, they're partisans, probably all of us on this panel who can vote in American elections are ready to, to, to cast our votes. The, the people who wait are almost always the people who have lingering questions. And the questions are twofold. Who am I gonna vote for? Do I think it matters? And actually then will I vote? So the pressure becomes, there, there's a lot of persuasion. And, and for both sides, Trump to talk about the economy and immigration and public safety, Harris to answer and, and talk about her agenda and, and the point she wants to, that will go forward. But about two weeks out, both campaigns will flip over to they only want to get their people to the polls because they've decided at that point all persuasion's over. It's motivation. And we're not there yet. The large parts of America are ready and motivated, but that last little bit that's going to decide winners and losers, that's very, very late. And that's where all all the attention, all the cameras, all the resources of both sides, our TV ads, our digital ads, our direct mail, our door-to-door -door campaigns, my side, the other side, we're all aiming at those people that are really going to decide in that last few, that last week, and even on election day. So it's a mix, uh, Kedavon Gorgistani, of uh, people who need persuading, uh, persuading for which candidate to vote for, or persuading to get out and vote. Tell us a little bit about the different paths uh, to, uh, to winning, because the U.S. arcane system, again, remind our viewers, it's not the candidate with the most votes who wins, it's the candidate who wins the most states. And therefore, uh, there are different scenarios. Different scenarios for uh, the, the path to 270, because that's the key number. You have to win 270 uh, electors in that electoral college to uh, win uh, the presidency. And so uh, basically, you start from the states that are pretty much safe. So you put the ones that are the red states to Donald Trump, the blue states to Kamala Harris, and you're around Kamala Harris 225, uh, Donald Trump 219. Uh, so the red ones are Donald Trump, the blue ones are uh, said to be safe for the Democrats. And then you have, uh, in this election, seven states that are considered uh, as uh, battlegrounds. And for Kamala Harris, uh, the clearest, easiest path to a victory goes through uh, the Great Lakes, uh, what is called the Blue Wall. Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, 10, 15, so Everything and here in yellow on in this yellow, map is up for grabs. Those are considered the battlegrounds. Some of them are extremely tight, so no one knows exactly where they're going to go, but if she wins the blue wall, and I'm not going to get into the, all of the details, but if she uh, gets that one elector in Nebraska, that brings her to 270. And that is why it's called the blue wall, because if they secure the blue wall, uh, Donald Trump uh, loses. For Donald Trump, uh, his best path is through the Sun Belt. So you're looking at the southern states in uh, yellow. For example, if he wins Arizona, Georgia, North Carolina, and he holds on to the other uh, red states, he needs one more of those blue walls. That's why the Democrats absolutely want to win those three blue wall states, because he needs one of those. Re remind us again, those three blue wall states. The br blue wall, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. Right. Those are key for uh, the Democrats. And Donald Trump needs those southern states, Arizona, Georgia, North Carolina. And talking about North Carolina, the fact that North Carolina is even in play right now is in itself showing a change in this campaign. Because when it was Joe Biden, the Democrats had all but pretty much given up on the possibility of North Carolina. And that it's very, now it's extremely uh, close. So that's where you see there are obviously other possibilities. There's also the possibility of an electoral college tie, which hasn't happened in a while, but uh, that could also uh, happen. But this is basically what the campaigns are uh, looking at. Even though you see all of these uh, states being a focus of these candidates, they go there, they campaign there because they see that all of the average of polling show that most of these states, yes, there's someone ahead, there's someone behind, but they're all pretty much within the margin of error. All right, uh, Kedavon there with a sadistic streak uh, by including <laughs> the possibility of a statistical tie among uh, uh, electors. It's already complicated enough, thank you. Uh, Nomiki Konst, uh, would you say we're in the home stretch yet? Has it begun? When did it begin or when will it begin? 
I mean, they like to say after Labor Day, it, the home stretch begins. It feels like the campaign just started for, for Democrats uh, with Kamala Harris. But uh, one thing I'll just note on, on the statistics is Donald Trump's campaign is trying very hard to keep Kamala Harris below 50 percent in popularity uh, uh, support nationally. That's with the popular vote, not with uh, the electoral vote, just to be clear, because they believe that if she goes above 50 percent, she or above, you know, she will win. Of course, anybody over 50 percent is likely to win. But in terms of reflection on the electoral vote. So he's trying very hard to poke holes at her so that her base does not turn out. There are some weaknesses in uh, the Democratic coalition right now. Gaza has been very difficult on many Arab Americans um, in this country. And there's a coalition that is coming together saying, trying to pressure Kamala Harris to be more aggressive when it comes to her Mideast policy. And they are reflected in states in, uh, you know, in Wisconsin and in Michigan, there are large um, Arab American communities there that could make a difference. So it's also important, while Kamala Harris is trying to win over these undecideds and she's trying to bring Republicans into the coalition and independents, she has to also motivate the, the base voters that are very frustrated with policies, maybe when it comes to fracking. Um, on one hand, she's pro-fracking, but environmental voters in Pennsylvania are also uh, very concerned and likely to express that frustration. And the more you have a base that's frustrated, the more division is played out on the ground. And um, I don't want the Democrats to take that for granted. We learned that in 2016. Um, I think Hillary Clinton, you know, she wanted to build this large coalition, but they, they wanted to move past the Bernie Sanders primary. And they didn't do a great job of reaching out to base progressive voters in different uh, communities. So that Arab American community could impact that blue wall in particular. The same thing with the Latino vote. The Latino vote is diverse. It's complicated. Um, and Donald Trump is, is being a little bit more sophisticated in outreach to different Latino communities. And I think the Kamala Harris campaign needs to understand that different communities in different areas with different backgrounds relate to issues differently. One thing I'll push, push back on um, with my colleague here is that it's not that the Harris campaign is losing working class voters. They're losing some male working class voters, but keeping the women. The gender divide is quite large. It's the largest in history. And women are definitely more likely to vote. They're reliable voters. They're hard voters to sway. But the Harris campaign seems to be doing so very well. And Donald Trump doesn't, and J.D. Vance in particular, do not seem to be making an effort to sway any women over. And I think that is the secret of this campaign. It's the obvious, but it is also the secret that the gender divide is going to win this election for Kamala Harris. One final question. I'll put it to you, Tristan Cabello, when you talk with your students. How is 2024 different from 2020? What, what are the things that are on their minds? Oh, it's massively different. I mean, the impact of uh, the campments uh, for Gaza on 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 on, in, on, on campus has had a, a very deep impact. And just like Naomi was saying, the fact that Kamala Harris is losing some of the Arab Muslim votes in Michigan, Georgia, and Pennsylvania. She's also losing some of uh, the most uh, leftist uh, youth in America. And this youth is starting to vote for uh, a minor, more obscure candidate, what we call a third party candidate. Uh, the name of this candidate is Jill Stein. She is the, the Green Party candidate. And so they're starting to vote more and more for this candidate. And what's very important here is that in 2016, uh, the number of votes that Jill Stein started to win in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Georgia, I think, was exactly the difference that Hillary Clinton needed in order to win those states. Mm. So it's it's really at the margins again, uh, but it's very important to take care of uh, those young people and the minorities. Consensus among the panel is, is that it will be close, Tristan Cabello. Very. I want to thank you. I want to thank Kedavan Gorgestani, uh, Nomiki Kans for being with us from New York City, Dan Hazelwood in Washington. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.